Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you to you and the Myosh team. Appreciate having the opportunity to uh, speak to your audience again. So thanks very much for that. Of course, this is the first for all first this year for us anyway to be delivering this from lockdown in Queensland. So if there's any background noise, homeschool learning, background chat type stuff, I apologize in advance. Um, it's also the first time I've delivered a webinar from home with a moustache and a hoodie. So guess what? There's a first for everything. And I guess not everything's bad about lockdown. So let's get started. So I thought before we started get to discussing the specifics of what HOP is and, and why we believe it's a, a valuable uh, change, maybe next step for organizations today in safety. I thought we'd talk a little bit about the evolution of safety and how it is we've got to a stage now where more and more people are looking for something different, looking for something new in the way they approach safety. Uh, so why the need for new approaches? Well, I think there's two kind of problems which we're all probably very familiar with and have all experienced to some extent, whether it's a little bit or it's a lot, we're all familiar with some of the problems associated with contemporary safety. Um, so let's look at the first problem top left. This isn't to uh, dig out anyone in particular. Um, we don't really want to be picking on Bunnings, but hey, they give us the headline a year or two ago about the uh, sausage sizzle gate, the, um, the incident of someone slipping on a onion in a Bunnings store. And of course that leaves us with a problem. What do we do? What do we do about a problem like this when someone slips on an onion from a sausage sizzle? We've asked this question uh, in lots of different countries all over the world. And the response is generally really quite interesting. And the range is from do nothing through to ban the sausage sizzle. Um, of course, we, we know what happened. Bunnings sent out a memo to all of their staff and all of their volunteers asking them to please uh, in future ensure that the onions and the ketchup went on the bottom with the sausage on top that will reduce the risk of these kind of incidents happening again in the future. Now we can talk all day about the, the rights and wrongs and maybe is it appropriate or it wasn't appropriate in that particular case. Um, but ultimately the question we have to find, we find ourselves asking is, is this really what safety is about? And is it really gonna build the credibility of the profession? Uh, and I think, you have to go to the people safety serving to find, you know, to get the answer for that. And pretty much everyone you speak to say, yeah, this is crazy. Now that's just one example, but we know that we, we, we hear these examples and every organization we go into and work with, they all have their own examples and stories of things that they've maybe even done themselves uh, in their own organization. Not that they're terribly comfortable or happy with, but the things that they've done in the name of, of safety. Um, and on the right hand side, we've got a graveyard here in uh, the United Kingdom in Plymouth, where the, the city council have come along and identified some of these gravestones are potentially unstable. Well, this is terrible. What are we going to do about this? Well, we're going to put signs on each of the ones which you've identified as being unstable, saying, warning, this is unstable gravestone. It could potentially fall on you. Everyone pretty much would have been in agreement. This isn't really about safety. This isn't improving safety. Um, this is maybe a misguided approach to, uh, to try and reduce liability. Perversely, this is probably actually increasing the council's liability or potential liability, that's another story. So organizations seem to spend more and more time doing these types of activities, which Greg Smith has labeled like bureaucratic safety or trivial safety, combined together paper safe type activities that create an illusion of safety safety work but doesn't necessarily translate into improved safety outcomes so in many industries you'll be familiar with the stats on lagging data in, in many different industries over recent years we've seen a plateauing of performance in terms of how many people we're either injuring or sadly how many people die in work so we're doing more and more stuff but more and more of the same stuff more and more compliance and more and more enforcement and so forth but it's not necessarily translating into better performance. Where does this come from? This approach we have today um, in safety, or a lot of organizations certainly have in safety. Well, you can trace the roots back to Frederick Winslow Taylor and scientific management. Frederick Winslow Taylor essentially came up, invented the, the concept of, of management. And while there was some valid 
observations and some obviously very valid theory from scientific management, which is still relevant today, does kind of create a, uh, a perception that managers and planners know best. Workers' role is just simply to, to follow those um, procedures, policies, guidelines. The best practices basically just do as they're told. Um, now, maybe that had a place in the time when Frederick Winslow Taylor developed these ideas and concepts. But many of the workplaces that Frederick Winslow Taylor was studying and working in at that time, those workplaces don't really exist in, the, in a country like Australia anymore. Much of that work, that kind of very standard, repeatable, linear, knowable work has either been automated or it's been offshored. We live in, a, um, in an economy or work in an economy now where we're so much more reliant on the adaptability and flexibility and the creativity of our workers to be able to deliver the goods. Many of us are working in organizations which are knowledge based as opposed to um, being reliant on the, the physical labor uh, of our people. So this kind of origin, scientific management, kind of leads us to, I guess, what we could call centralized control, a centralized control model of safety management, which is very much dependent on rules, guidelines, procedures, risk management, centralized best ways of doing things. And of course, we need all of those things. The question is, to what extent do we need those things? To what point do we prescribe policies, procedures, and guidelines? What room is there for the individual and for, for people who are doing the work every day? How much reliance is there on them? In this approach, which Eric Holnagel helpfully labeled safety one, people tend to be seen as the problem to control. Variability and adaptability is bad. It's working against our beautiful system, which is aimed to try and get standardization of good outcomes through following policy and procedure. But in more recent years, we've begun to question the, the kind of assumptions of scientific management and centralized control. So, well, is safety just down to having all these things in place and then these things stop accidents from happening? Well, many thinkers, including Holnagel, Conklin and Decker and the HRO folks previous to that kind of came with this kind of concept that maybe safety isn't just the absence of things going wrong. Maybe it's the presence of capacity or it's the presence of something that makes work go well, as opposed to just purely avoiding bad things happening. Now you can think about it. Well, it's not just saying the same thing. Depends on how you think about it. If I was to write a book about making successful marriages, I'm not going to do that, by the way. But if I was to do that, and I only went out and I interviewed, we did some original research, and all the people I interviewed were people who had been divorced, I could write a really good book about what not to do in a marriage. That's not the same thing as going and speaking to people who have been happily married for a long time, who tell you the things to do to have a happy and successful marriage. We're facing a similar sort of situation with safety. We have a lot of focus on what not to do. But what is it which is make things go well? What is it that enables successful outcomes? We generally don't spend that much time thinking about or going and looking at that. One of the things that enables things to go well is what we call adaptive capacity. So in the past, our approach has been very much about centralized control. Adaptive capacity is not a instead of, but it's an and. And it's about then in the future in safety, balancing this centralized control, but then also allowing adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity at both a local level, frontline worker level, but also building that adaptive capacity at an organizational level. So what do we mean by adaptive capacity? Obviously, the background here is obviously a big pile of elastic bands, which can be formed conveniently into an elastic band ball, which is one of our logos for to, to demonstrate hop. But adaptive capacity is 
the ability of a system to be able to flex, adapt, and change to ensure still we get good outcomes, even in adverse conditions or adverse times. How much of our organizations relied on adaptive capacity in the last 18 months? Many organizations have completely changed the way they operate to successfully continue operating. And that's been heavily dependent on not necessarily some great plan and centralized control, but through allowing adaptive capacity, developing and growing that adaptive capacity and building trust and engagement with the people who work within their organization. So adaptive capacity is the name of the game. It's what we're aiming to build more of in our organizations. The amazing thing is we already have a lot of adaptive capacity. We already have it in abundance in our frontline workers. Maybe we just don't spend that much time looking at it. So oftentimes, centralized control or safety one done to excess is actually working against the adaptive capacity we already have. We don't want to over constrain adaptive capacity. We want to enable it where it's appropriate and then put parameters around it, such as in places like around our critical risk when it's not appropriate. But we want to try and work with adaptive capacity. And that leads us to, to HOP. So what's HOP? What's it got to do with adaptive capacity? Well, the first thing to say is HOP is not a program. HOP is an operating philosophy. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of behaving. It's how it affects everything we to do with safety, how we, we think about success, how we think about failure, the, the role of people, the role of our systems. And it very much uh, builds on this idea of adaptive capacity. It's about setting people up for success and creating conditions so that good outcomes can emerge. It works with our kind of um, previous approaches around centralized control, but also goes beyond just centralized control. But we've got these pictures here of the icebergs. So all of the, the policies, the procedures, and the tools that we use, they're the things that are visible. They sit above the waterline. Now we can change those things really quite easily. Get some new consultants in, they'll change the wallpaper for us, new posters, new tools some new things we're gonna talk about, done. But HOP doesn't work like that, or any of the new view approaches don't work like that. They operate firstly at a, under or below the waterline, working on the, the beliefs, the values and assumptions of our, us as an organization, how we operate, how we view our people and the role they play in creating safety every day. So that's the first thing to say. It's not a program, it's not something we can download, tick the box and we've done it, we've got hot now. It's based on a series of principles, five principles in fact. And these five principles on the face of it are really quite straightforward. So what are they? First of all, people make mistakes. Secondly, blame fixes nothing. Third, context drives behavior. Fourth, learning is vital. And finally, response matters. On the face of it, all of these things are really quite self-evident, really, uh, and there's nothing too objectionable about them. That in itself can be a positive thing because it's very easy to, to communicate these principles and to talk about them. People generally immediately open, yeah, okay, this, is, this kind of makes sense. But underneath that then it allows room for conversation around a whole lot of other different and maybe more complicated and involved concepts. So we're going to do a quick flying tour through these five principles, what they mean, and then and finally at the end, how they enable the organization to get better outcomes and how they enable us to build adaptive capacity in our organization. So first up, people make mistakes. So my question, a rhetorical question for you, is have you ever made a mistake at work? Of course, the obvious answer is yes. Every keyboard in the world has two keys on it, which tell us we all make mistakes, delete, backspace. But we generally make more, probably more significant mistakes than even just that, than, than typos and, and mistakes in, in documents. I want you to spend a moment to think about a mistake you've made in a work setting at some point in your career. Think back to that time. 
I want you to think about a few things. How did it make you feel? And then what did you learn from it? Most people, when they th- reflect back on that time, they bring back, it brings back a whole lot of different things for them. But one, they generally always say to me, yeah, at the time I felt pretty terrible. I felt defensive. I felt like I let myself down, like I let the company down, like my colleagues down, so on and so forth. Pretty much no one ever has said to me, oh yeah, it was deliberate and it was willful and I really didn't care. So people make mistakes, even when they go to work with the best of intentions, which is one of our kind of starting assumptions with, with HOT. The vast majority of people come to work with good intentions to do good work. So when we think about that, it doesn't really make sense to have campaigns or have uh, slogans and, and programs based on trying to eliminate all mistakes, errors, and so forth, because we are never going to change the fact that we are human. We are all fallible. And even with the very best of intentions, we all still make mistakes. So el- eradicating, eliminating, getting rid of error and mistakes well, on the face of it, sound initially sounds, oh, yeah, well, of course, why would we want errors and mistakes? It's kind of just makes sense. We want to eliminate that. But the reality is we're never going to achieve it. So pushing further and further on that, particularly with a centralized control approach, if only people follow the procedures, mistakes wouldn't happen. It actually works out to be counterproductive. So we know this. We know people make mistakes. What we want to do then is take a more appropriate approach to then how we understand the mistakes and how we actually then can learn from them. Todd Conklin uses this expression, workers don't cause failures. Workers trigger latent conditions that lie dormant in organizations waiting for the specific moment in time. Think back to your own mistake that you made. Now you have one way to look at this. Well, it was all my fault and I was just stupid and I shouldn't have done this. And, and that's quite a common response is to beat ourselves up over mistakes we make. But the other approach is to think back to the conditions and the context you were in. No doubt the actions that you did at the time made sense to you at the time. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done it. So it's that approach we wish to take. As Decker says here, underneath every simple, obvious story about human error, there is a more, there is a deeper, more complex story. So it can say it's about the organization, but it's not just about the organization. It's about the, the context and the conditions of the work in which that error or mistake happened. So that's the first principle. We're human, we're fallible, we make mistakes. And if we want to get, if we, our aim is to get to a position where no one makes mistakes, no one makes errors, we're just setting ourselves up to be disappointed because it's never going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean mistakes and errors are desirable. It just means we have to take a different approach. Secondly, blame fixes nothing. Now, that in itself, again, is really very straightforward statement. And I'm sure if you think about it, we'd all agree with it. Blame doesn't fix anything, doesn't make anything better. It might make us feel better short term, but it doesn't fix whatever it is which has been damaged. But as humans, we have this kind of inbuilt need sometimes to to blame. Nietzsche made this interesting observation. The unknown brings with it danger, disquiet, and worry. One's first instinct is to get rid of these awkward conditions. The first idea which can explain the unknown as known feels so good, it's held to be true. We see this so often, don't we? Not only in our organizations, but in wider society. Something goes wrong. Something's not going well for us. Why has this happened? Who's to blame? And generally some simple and incorrect or only partly correct story is latched onto, this explains this bad thing. Now in our organizations, this often looks like we've had an incident, we've had an accident, someone's been hurt. That's not good. We don't like that. But equally, we don't like um, 
the fact that then there's generally a lot of questions being asked, well, how has this been able to happen? Oftentimes, the first explanation is, well, I didn't follow procedure. They hadn't completed a, safe, uh, a JSA or a SWIMS or whatever it might take five. There are lots of simple explanations we can come up with why something happened. And oftentimes they end up resulting in, in blame. But does that enable us to actually learn and improve? Does it even allow us to truly understand what happened? Generally, we find no. So the consequences of blame, this is not going to be telling you anything you don't already know. Blame reduces openness and sharing. It inhibits learning and the flow of information. And it actually damages true accountability. Blame is not the same as accountability. Oftentimes when we have conversations with clients about blame and how they maybe do or don't blame workers when things go wrong, blame and accountability often get very mixed up, but they're different things. We can have accountability without blaming people. And ultimately, blame is detrimental to trust and engagement. And I think all of us pretty much would agree we want greater trust and engagement, not less. So why would we do anything which is going to harm those two things we really want? So blame harms both the person giving the blame. So that can be the organization. It can be the manager. And it harms the person being blamed, too, in obvious ways. So it's not really a very useful, a very useful thing, blame. We like this expression and it tends to, we tend to find it resonates with people when we go around and talking to organizations about, about hop. When you plant lettuce, if it doesn't grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look at the reasons it's not doing well. It may need fertilizer, more water or less sun. You never blame the lettuce. Yet if we have problems with our friends or family or our workers, we blame them. So isn't that interesting? You plant a lettuce and it's not doing so well, it's not thriving. You look at the conditions. Someone's not thriving, they're not doing well, not what we expect of them, not performing to the safety standard we want. It's obviously their fault. So we find this is a really interesting, a really useful and interesting quote to ponder on. How good are we at looking at and understanding the context and the conditions of work and how they may be impacting on the performance? The performance maybe just with the symptoms of other problems. Blame short circuits that system. We just go straight to blame the person without looking at the context. So that leads nicely then into our third principle. I think we should be really actually genuinely interested in the context. Behavior happens, doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't emerge from a vacuum. It emerges from context and from conditions. So when we see something happening, which maybe is strange, unusual, scary, violation of rules, not really doing what exactly what we expect or not how we expect it to be done, rather than just focusing on the individual or individuals involved, generally is sensible to look at the context and try and understand that. Almost any strange behavior there will be some reason why it makes sense to the people involved. I was recently told an interesting story uh, by a colleague who's uh, one of their children works at, um, at McDonald's. And they told me whenever they have a quiet spell in the McDonald's, one of the staff will jump into their car and drive round and round through, through the drive through. And they think, what a strange thing to do. Why would you drive around and round and round? Well, the very reason they jump in the car and drive it around and round is because their KPIs aren't looking so good for the day in terms of the time it's taken to serve each individual customer. The person drives through this uh, drive through several times. Well, and that can start to bring down that average time to serve each customer. Makes the numbers look good. Well, that's clearly not the intended reason for those KPIs. But KPIs, as with many other things, they influence behavior in a way which is both intended, but oftentimes unintended too. Take the picture we're looking at right now, different situation. Who has ever been to the supermarket with the sole intention of buying one thing, milk? I'm sure 
many of you, if not all of you, at some point have been to a supermarket with the intention of buying that one necessity. Where is milk located? Generally speaking, in the very back left or very back right corner of a supermarket. They're not gonna place them very conveniently at the front of the supermarket, are they for us? Oh, just in case you forgot milk or you need milk on the way home, here's a small amount conveniently located right at the front of the supermarket. So you can just grab it and go. No, the supermarket's not gonna do that. They want you to walk through the whole store, through every aisle end to get in order to get that milk. Now, why do they do that? Do we go into the supermarket? Do we lose all free will and ability to decide for ourselves what we're gonna do while we're in the supermarket? Of course not. They can't control us, but they can influence us and the decisions that we make. So they optimize their store to influence us. So we spend more money. Now that's a deliberate and um, planned way they influence our behavior. Now our workers are being influenced all the time in lots of different ways. Some of which we are aware of, some of which we're completely unaware of. Some are planned, some are unplanned or unintended consequences of other, intention, of other interventions we've made into the work. So when we see things going wrong, accidents, incidents, or we're seeing behaviors which we don't want to see, procedures not being followed, followed or violations, or whatever it might be, we can on the one hand choose to focus on the people involved, or on the other hand, we can choose to take a systems view, which helps us to try and understand the context. Why does this make sense? Now, in order to do this, I'm not gonna go through all the principles there on the left-hand side, but there's a few that I'm just gonna quickly focus on. First up there, field expert involvement. If you ever wanna understand something, you need the experts to help you understand it. Now, in the context we're talking about, of maybe rules being broken or, of an incident happening, we need the people involved because they're the people who, who know the work, they know the event on the day. So, of course, we need the field experts involved. And we need them involved because they help us to understand what we call here local rationality. People do things that make sense to them. Now, we can choose to just blame the person involved and get rid of them. But if it made sense to that one person to do, that action, you can almost be certain that it will make sense to someone else to do the same thing. So we need to understand that local rationality. Now that local rationality will only be shared with us if it's safe to do so. So that comes to just culture and our previous principle, blame fixes nothing. So people have to feel safe to be able to tell us, hey, this is what's going on. This is how work really gets done. And this is the reason why. It's in response to the following. And what invariably we find this is in the response to is these next two elements, demand and pressure and resources and constraints. Find me an organization anywhere in the world that has no pressure, no demand on it beyond what it can sustain. That's all the perfect resources in terms of time, people, equipment, knowledge, information, and has a set of rules and procedures and guidelines that perfectly match that work and perfectly help enable it. Our organization doesn't exist. That's all of our organizations. We all face variable demand and pressure. Pressure can be operational pressure, financial pressure, production pressure, whatever it might be. There's always pressure uh, to either internal or even external. We're always trying to make do the best we can with the resources we have available. Uh, and we always have rules, policies, procedures, and guidelines, which either to some degree don't fully suit the work. These are normal things. These are things that happen in, in organizations all the time. But it's our workers then who are dealt with trying to balance all of these things. And what this ends up looking like is trade-offs and performance variability. Now, we just said adaptive capacity is good. Uh, and generally speaking, the most of us majority of the time, it is. How is it that our organization achieves good outcomes most of the time? Is it down to the centralized control element or is it down to the adaptive capacity? We need both, but it's the adaptive capacity which oftentimes makes 
success happen. It's our people's ability to be able to so deal with all the conditions and despite them still achieve good outcomes. So the question is asked here, how often are you, you or your workers under pressure to get the job done, working with less than ideal resources, working with unclear or ambiguous rules, guidelines and procedures, and juggling competing and important priorities? I would say it happens an awful lot. And this is pretty normal in organizations. So despite that, we and our people generally create success. So if we want to make an impact in terms of improving safety, it's in these things we need to, to look. How is it our people create success? And what is it which makes it more difficult? So as a result of these kind of challenges, these competing priorities, what we see here is, as Conklin says, workers are as safe as they need to be without being too safe in order to be productive. That is until they're not, they have an accident, they have an incident, or they get caught breaking a rule. And then all, all of a sudden, well, now you're no longer safe. Clearly, you've been involved in this incident, accident, or we found you breaking a rule. But that's based on hindsight. So what we need to do is learn or you need to be better at learning about the context and conditions of the work and how we make it better. So that brings us to our fourth principle, learning is vital. This next slide is probably, for most of you will be familiar with the idea, you'll be familiar with the terms, black line, blue line, workers imagine, workers done. These are probably the most important concepts within, within HOP and within the new view. Every organization in the world has, we call a black line, workers imagined, policies, procedures, guidelines. This is our centralized control piece. This is how we imagine work happens and how it stays safe. Every organization in the world also has a blue line, work is done, how it actually gets done and what's required to achieve good outcomes. Now, obviously that line there is shown as being squiggly. Sometimes we're overperforming the required standards, sometimes we're underperforming. It doesn't really matter if it's over or under, it is the necessity to get the job done. Now, down here we have this red line, the, the variable hazardous world out there, and we have this margin between that and where we want to be operating. Now, every now and then we'll have an accident or an incident, and it's incredibly easy to come along and go, ah, We've immediately found why this happened. Look at this blue line. Look at this gap. They're not supposed to be on this blue line. They're supposed to be on the black line. There's the cause of the accident. Weren't following procedure. Hadn't done the following steps, et cetera, et cetera. You've seen these types of things happen before, I'm sure. But is it? Is that the cause? Is that gap the cause? Really, the gap is just a symptom of other conditions of the context in which the work is taking place. If the gap was the cause, we'd be having accidents all the time. But we're not having accidents all the time. This blue line adaption is happening in response to the context and conditions, and people generally make it successful. So as... Todd Conklin and Bob Edwards would say, workers are masters of complex adaptive behavior, masters of the blue line. This adaptive capacity is there and is happening all the time. It's how our people create success. We often don't just, we just choose not to look at it. Or we'll go and look at the kind of blue line when it's been involved in some sort of incident or accident. But it's been there previously. You want evidence that the blue line exists? Just think for a moment about this. In many parts of the world, work to rule is a form of industrial action. What is work to rule? Well, it's when a unionized workforce say, that's it, we're gonna follow every guideline, policy and procedure exactly as written. Why is that a form of industrial action? Because productivity goes through the floor. 
It's a way of harming the organization's financial performance. Now, if the systems and policies and procedures we have in place were the reason why we're being successful, work to rule wouldn't be industrial action, would it? It would be just normal. Performance just carries on, productivity just carries on. But this, what we could call malicious compliance with all the organization's prescribed policies and procedures and guidelines has the opposite effect. Of course, then when in these organizations, when work to rule is ended, productivity goes back to normal. What does that tell you about the policies and the procedures and the guidelines? Clearly, it's not the following of them, which is creating the successful outcomes. Finally, I was, and just another uh, aspect of this blue line, once you're aware of it, you will see it almost everywhere you go. We just don't generally pay attention to it. Um, a little while back there, a uh, year before last, my little boy developed asthma or asthma-like symptoms as they prefer to call it in, in hospital. And three times, it's always in the middle of the night, it's developed uh, some problems with breathing, just jump in the car, drive down to the nearest hospital, check them in, go through the whole process and spend the night in the hospital. And I lost count each time they went there. The times I heard doctors or nurses saying, I'm not really supposed to do this, but what they would say, tell me about was this kind of tension between the black line and the blue line. The procedure, the policy, the black guideline is X, but I'm going now to do Y. And the reason why they were gonna do that alternative course of action was to get a better outcome for the patient. Not because they were, malevolent rule breakers, but because they genuinely cared about the patients they were looking after and they wanted to help get the best outcome. Now, in that instance, in each of those instances, the guidelines or the stipulated standard of care actually conflicted with what they knew would be better for the patient. Now, this happens in workplaces all around the world all the time. Local adaptability in order to get good outcomes. And the vast majority of the times it does get good outcomes. So when things go wrong, generally what happens in many organizations, things go wrong. We have these three, three elements then. There's the context leading up to it, there was the consequence, and then there's a retrospective understanding. The context is the kind of complex, messy organization we work in. The consequence is the the big bang or the thing that's gone wrong. The retrospective understanding is like then the step-by-step, -step, simple, linear story of what went out, what went wrong. Often looking like two or three, if we're lucky, causes, oftentimes focused on the individuals involved. These often we call simple explanations. I mentioned here, saying an event was caused by error or not following procedures like saying an object fell due to gravity. It's always true, it just doesn't teach us anything. So saying there was people made mistakes or people didn't follow procedures when things go wrong, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? There's no procedure that says, oh, at this point, get injured. So it's not really learning. The learning is, well, why do the things that happen make sense to the people involved? What are the context and conditions that were driving either the behaviors, decisions at the time? And that requires then genuine learning. Is that the extent of learning though? Learning when things go wrong? Well, any of you are familiar with safety too and Holnagel's work there will be familiar with this idea of, well, we don't wanna just learn from things going wrong. We wanna learn from normal work because we know that when you compare normal work with accidents and events, the vast majority of the context and the conditions are the same. I, most of the same uh, ingredients to, to failures are also there in success. So we don't have to wait for accidents and incidents to learn. We can go and look at normal work, which is happening in our organizations right now. We'll see the blue line, but the blue line of itself isn't that interesting. It's why it makes sense for these adaptions and variations to be happening. It's there where we can really start to learn about the underlying issues, the real systemic problems that we want to address, not just the people 
we can't be focusing on the people the whole time or playing whack-a-mole, chasing after the problems and the behaviors the whole time. So we want to learn from not just the accidents and incidents, but this whole broad swathe of distribution of work where the vast majority of outcomes are good. What do we need to be able to be an organization that can do this, that can learn well, that can understand the context and conditions of work? Well, one of the things we need is this fifth principle, response matters. So how we deal with bad news, how we deal with things that we don't like, things that don't go to plan. Well, with any of these situations, we have a choice. We can learn and improve, or we can blame and punish. We can't do both. I'd say the exception to that is, yes, maybe you can blame and learn and improve and blame and punish, but you can only do it once. As a long-term proposition, you have to choose which direction you're going in, learning and improving or blaming and, and punishing. So that's the choice we have to make. When things go wrong, if we want to learn and understand with the intent of then actually making things better. We have to create because, uh, the conditions through our response where it's safe for people to share. We had a client when they first started working with us uh, in this in the kind of hop space, they used to tell us whenever we used to go and do our ICAM investigations after someone had been involved in an incident, we'd ask them questions like, why did they do that? And they'd say, I don't know. Sounds like a great investigation, doesn't it? How much learning is happening? Very little, because the people had already learned. Next thing that happens after this investigation is I'm out the door. And they had a long record of showing people the door for breaking safety rules or being involved in accidents and incidents. So that has to change if you want to learn and improve. So after an event, things are always obvious. Beforehand, the people who are in that situation, who are doing the work, everything seems normal. In hindsight, then it becomes obvious. Oh, that was clearly wrong, clearly the wrong thing to have done. So kind of the responses that an organization is trying to develop, which is going to support both adaptive capacity and enable learning, things like can't fix stupid, or if only they had. Yeah, well, I'm sure the people involved in an incident or an event afterwards are thinking, if only we had. It doesn't explain why they did what they did, though, does it? What were they thinking? Now, that could be a good question, but it has to be asked in a very different way, doesn't it? Why did no one stop the work? Because they're not clairvoyant. And if people knew what was about to happen, what's about to happen, they would stop the work. And I guess sometimes the most worrying one, had they done a JSA? Well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but it still hurt. <laughs> Does it doing the JSA change that? So what we want to develop is way more uh, humanistic and better responses. Has the welfare of those involved been considered? This isn't just an inconvenient number, which is gonna mess up our dashboard. This is actually people who have been, or a person who has been hurt at work. What is the organization's responsibility here? What can we learn from this? How do we get better from here? This is more focused on restoration and making good on what's been damaged, as opposed to getting even for something having been damaged. So, in summary, the principles, people make mistakes, we're all human. Blame is not gonna fix that. Just increasing the number of beatings isn't gonna improve performance. What we wanna do is understand the context because understanding the context will enable us to improve and it helps us to understand why people do the things they do and why it makes sense. We wanna then therefore enable learning. Learning enables us both when things go wrong but also from everyday work, they enable us to improve. And finally, we need to manage our response. So through doing or working to implement these principles into the way we manage safety and the way we manage work in our organization, we are creating the conditions which will enable adaptive capacity. They will enable things to go well rather than go badly. There are obviously a whole lot of other flow on benefits from adopting the kind of hop approach 
not least in the organizations we work with, we've seen massive improvements in terms of things like engagement, trust, ownership, as well as the obvious kind of now having a better and clearer understanding of what's happening in the organization and why it's happening. But that is hot in a nutshell, the five principles, why it makes sense today and how it enables adaptive capacity. At this point, we'll say thank you very much for uh, joining us and to go over to any questions that anyone might have in relation to the presentation. Thank you, Andy. Um, while we just wait for some questions, um, I just want to put a link in for the next webinar next week, part two in the chat um, to everyone. Okay. And um, also for the last week's webinar on prevention is not enough. I want to drop that one in here in case the video for that one was a bit late coming. So that's also being dropped in there. So question, um, love the idea. This is from Stephen, but how do we answer the legal issues when we go to court? Um, oh, people get caught up on the, on the legal side of things. Um, first thing I would suggest is don't rely on my opinion, but if you haven't already, get hold of Greg Smith's book, Paper Safe. Greg is a lawyer, uh, as well as being in the past a uh, safety uh, professional. So he will be able to provide really quite compelling um, evidence that our traditional approach, centralized control to the nth degree, is not necessarily going to be a protection in any case. So there are generally, in my opinion, no legal issues involved with doing something like uh, the new view, hot, safety differently, safety two, whatever. In actual fact, you're probably putting you in a stronger position. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say on the legal side of things. The other thing which I would say is uh, doing something like um, HARP or Safety 2 is actually going to allow the organization to be actually better informed about what's really going on, which actually is going to put you in good stead when it comes to any legal issues or uh, prosecutions or whatever being threatened. You're going to be in a better position. And as Bob Edwards always says, surely it's better to know what's going on and then actually have a chance of doing something about it rather than the first you know of something going on is when it's actually already gone badly wrong in which case then it's too late to, to undo. So um, I generally think it's a good thing around legal liability. Okay, so um, Sue says, how is HOP different from safety differently? Different terminology. <laughs> um, they've come from different sort of places, um, but in my opinion, there's not a great deal of uh, a difference actually between, between HOP and, and safety differently. Um, Todd Conklin, in his book, The Five Principles of Hop, actually does a whole comparison and puts them side by side um, and shows how there's a great degree of alignment. We prefer hop as a term and the five principles because we think they're easier to communicate. They contain a lot more, a bit more practical. Um, but really, there isn't, in my opinion, a great deal of difference between safety differently and, and hop. Okay, someone says, as a lead auditor, how do you audit for HOP being in place? Um, good question. Um, HOP and lead auditing are two different things, in, generally speaking. And I'm not, when I'm lead auditing, which is not very often these days, um, I'm generally not, although it's the, kind of the lens I guess I look at the world through, uh, you're don't, don't, not generally auditing for, for HOP. For one thing, HOP is something maybe you can assess an organization and say, well, how well are they implementing these principles into, their, into the work they do uh, and how they manage safety? Uh, but I'd say that's more of a, an assessment as opposed to an audit. Okay. Um, Veronica says, what are, in your experience, the best ways to approach the accountability and how to increase it? So... Accountability, true accountability, when things go wrong, is to involve the people um, who are involved and actually help enable them to take ownership and try and contribute towards making things better to putting things right. Simply blaming people or sacking people, unless there's a really good reason, 
uh, like this was malicious and willful damage or will deliberate and willful harm of someone else. Um, in which case, blame, yeah, you know, fill your boots. Uh, but accountability is really achieved through giving people ownership and getting them to take responsibility. Uh, and that's a different conversation than blame. So uh, HOP take, is very much about growing accountability uh, through things like when we, which we'll talk about next week on the next webinar, things like learning teams and, and the approaches we do, which involve frontline workers. That's about pushing down ownership and responsibility uh, to the front line. So it actually gets more accountability, it grows accountability, as opposed to it being something which is imposed uh, after an event. Um, so Valerie asks, who is the quote from saying an event was caused by error like gravity? Um, that's a good question. I can't remember the source of it, which is why I didn't put the source underneath on the slide. Uh, it's been attributed to a few different people, but it's actually from uh, an engineer from like the 1970s or something, but I can't remember the actual source. But if you uh, are the, happy to share you the, the quote and you can go away and Google it and find the original source, but I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, sorry. Um, and Stephen says, the uses for HOP are clear to me for post-incident response. What are some ways you apply the five principles proactively before incidents occur in setting aside from investigations? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I've heard even said our hops really all about after things go wrong as opposed to um, in advance. But I think all five principles can be used kind of like looking backwards in terms of under trying to understand something which has already happened, but are also instrumental in terms of looking forwards. So the first principle, people make mistakes. Well, we know that, we can anticipate that. And if we, when we go into hot fundamentals in, in depth, we, we look at all the various different contexts and conditions that make mistakes more likely. So then they're, they're things that we can focus on, things like uh, error traps. They're things we can identify in advance of people making errors and mistakes. Uh, changing of performance modes and things like that. Well, we know that when people change performance modes, when people are in autopilot or become complacent, as sometimes it's called, they're more likely to make mistakes. We can identify those situations up front. So um, context drives behavior. Well, that's very much then aligned with some of the human factors type perspective around we're not focused on the individual so much, but we're trying to create a system which helps support success. So we're setting people up for success as opposed to setting people up for, for failure. Uh, learning is vital. Well, we say this all the time better to learn from normal work than to wait for things to go wrong. So, uh, and the response piece is all really about building an organization where it's safe to people to share, for people to dissent, um, to uh, contribute productively to uh, whatever it is the organization is doing. So the principles that can all be applied in a forward looking way, as well as, a, you know, when things have gone wrong, using them to help understand things going, why they went wrong. Okay, so Christine asks, given our business KPIs can often influence an unintended outcome, can you provide any guidance on developing safety KPIs that align with the HOP program? It, 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 almost every webinar, we can guarantee there'll be something will come up about measurement. Um, it's very difficult to say, well, what are the, um, what are the things you should be measuring um, going forward? What I, one thing I would say is initially, don't necessarily change anything which is being measured. You can make a big impact just by changing the way you communicate what's being measured. Because there's a very big difference between measuring something to know versus measuring something to put a target on it. As soon as you put a target on something and even worse, put incentives on it, then all of a sudden that's going to have an impact and it's going to start to have an impact on changing people's behaviors. Uh, sometimes for the intended and sometimes un unintended. So, What's some of the things that organizations have been, been doing that are working on stuff like HOP, they've, for example, LTIFR or TRIFR or whatever, they've stopped communicating that to the, to the workforce. They still measure it and they report it up to the board. Um, but now that influence of the first thing people see is how many days since an accident, oh, I don't want to be the person who, who stuffs that up. That kind of, that whole conversation is, is gone. So, that's the first thing to say. It doesn't necessarily mean getting rid of measures. Um, and the other thing is 
you want to start moving towards measures which help you to understand that, that kind of adaptive capacity. Um, and there's lots of different things you can explore and there. there's lots of stuff that's been written and said about that. So um, yeah, I'd go away and look at some of the safety differently stuff that uh, Deco has put out there um, around building capacity and, and maybe wanting to measure it. Okay, well, that's all the questions so um and we're just about on time so that's fantastic um i did share a link earlier to the um registration for part two of this next week with andy and also the uh, recording and podcast of last week's webinar so andy thank you very much for that very interesting no and, worries um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week see you next week okay thanks everyone bye thank you, everyone.